deep. Father, I ask you for the gift of teaching. In the Heavenly Father, I ask for wisdom, discernment. I pray for those that hear this here in the church and hear it over the internet and hear it later on DVDs and tapes and what have you. I pray that you'd bless the study of your word. I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, go to Isaiah 14 with me now, please. Again today, we're going to move from Lucifer to Satan. But right now, I'm going to stick with Lucifer just a little while longer. And uh, what I'm going to try to do when I move from Lucifer to Satan is to show you the, the, uh, the great uh, disparity uh, in the minds of uh, so many of these occultists as it relates to Lucifer and Satan because they don't like to admit or acknowledge that there is a Satan. They think it's a principle, an evil principle. But Lucifer, on the other hand, they worship. And so therefore they make this separation between Satan and Lucifer. And, uh, you know, when you get to studying this, you realize that there is a, these people are deadly serious with this. And um, uh, when we study the Bible, and the Bible is the absolute authority for what we believe, we have to go back to the Scripture. Then we're going to have to take what the Bible says about Lucifer, what the Bible says about Satan, what the Bible says about evil spirits, demons, what have you, what the Bible says about the spirit world. We're going to stick with the Bible and then let the... Uh, uh, let the rest of it fall where it may. In Isaiah chapter number 14 and verse 12, the only time the word shows up in your Bible is, is uh, in uh, Lucifer. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cast, uh, cut down to the ground, which didst weaken nations? And this is a Latin word that shows up in the King James Bible and uh, Jerome's Latin Vulgate is the first time that it shows up in a Bible, per se. You know, a Bible where you have all the books of the Bible brought together, 66 books. Jerome's Latin Vulgate shows up with Lucifer. And, of course, it uh, immediately draws criticism because what in the world is a Latin word doing in the uh, King James Bible? Since the New Testament was written in Koine Greek, uh, who had the audacity to use the word, La to use the word Lucifer to translate Hillel, which is a Hebrew word? found in Isaiah 14.12. And uh, the word Hillel in Isaiah 14.12 is looking far past the king of Babylon and is looking into the spirit world and to a being much higher than the king of Babylon. And this is why the word is translated Lucifer. And then the early church fathers took that Lucifer of Isaiah 14.12 and said, this is the devil. And the reason they said that is because they compared it with what the Lord said when he said, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now when the Lord Jesus Christ said, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven, he did not say, I saw a evil principle being cast out of heaven. When he said, the prince of this world cometh and hath, no, and hath nothing in me, he always referred to Satan as an individual, not a principle, not an evil influence or something of that nature, but an entity, a living entity. And that, of course, is what Satan is. A study in the Bible is to determine uh, what the Bible says about Satan, where he came from, and where he's going, which is very important to help us understand because he does have an origin, he's a creature, and he does have a destiny because he comes under the judgment of God. So today I'm going to talk about one man in particular and try to show you this one man in this one man, pull these things together and give you an idea of how this works in the real world. Uh, philosophical things are fine, you know. Uh, your professor in the college or somewhere is going to give you a lot of high-sounding ideas, and that's all fine, but how does it work out in the real world, the world that you live in day by day? Now, this man is an Englishman. His name's Alistair Crowley. He lived in the early 1900s, and he is, uh, by his own admission, he says that he is the beast of Revelation chapter number 13, and the number 666 is his number. Uh, he identifies himself with Lucifer, and, uh, you know, we get into the idea today that uh, from so many in, uh, in the occult world 
that uh, Lucifer is one of the monads or one of the uh, uh, one of the em 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 emanations of the monad, the pleroma, the high principle, the spirit principle. That Lucifer is on an equality with Christ and Sophia. Usually, they put the three of them together. And it's very important to understand this principle because this is what this is the this is this is what determines the way they interpret things. Once again, this spirit principle, this monad, this pleroma that Plato talked about, is the guiding spirit principle of all things invisible. But this spirit principle has made itself known emanations coming forth from it in the form of Lucifer, the Christ, the Christ, the anointing, and Sophia, the wisdom. So therefore you have light, anointing, and wisdom. That's three very powerful things. Light is not Christ. Light is Lucifer, the light bearer. Are you following me so far? The Christ is the anointing, the manifestation of the power. And then Sophia is the wisdom. This is the emanation that comes forth from this pleroma. Gnostics believe that, so do witches, so do Satanists, so do all the rest of the occult world. So do the people who are right now in the process of creating a one world government. Yeah. All of this uh, defines their religion. They are elitist and they believe that they are eminently greater than you are and much smarter than the herd. And we're the herd. I'm part of the herd. Right. So are you. And so these people are the movers and shakers of what's going on. Woodrow Wilson, who was the architect of the, uh, you might say, well, they started League of Nations and, and that which became the United Nations, the architect of, uh, of the modern one world movement toward a one world government. Uh, I can't quote him verbatim, but I'll paraphrase what Woodrow Wilson said. He said that there is in the shadows a shadow government a power that we don't know anything about that is there when I came in and when I'm gone and when the next president comes in and the next president's gone, this power is still there. And this power is what's running things. And there are people today who firmly believe that John Fitzgerald Kennedy was assassinated by those powers yeah. because he made some statements right before he died. He gave one speech, which is well known, which is uh, you can get a, you can record you can you can play the recording on the internet, where he talked about secret societies, and he said a free people, referring to Americans, a free people have always abhorred secret societies, and of course, what uh, President Kennedy was alluding to was the fact that there are secret societies controlling lesser secret societies controlling lesser secret societies. Bottom line is that as you go up the rungs, as you rise in the system, you learn more. But as you learn more, you are more culpable. And as you learn more, you're more accountable. And as you learn more, you're more condemned. Because you must sell your soul eventually to Satan to rise to the highest levels. And that's exactly what they've done. So we have those who have lived in the past who have essentially laid down what we say the, are the guidelines of what the occult world believes. One of them was Hela Petrovna Blavatsky, a Russian that lived in the 1800s. She founded what's called Theosophy. It's a conjunction of Theos, the Greek word for God, Sophie or Sophist, Sophia, the word for Greek word for wisdom, so the wisdom of God. Helen Blavatsky. Her disciple was Aleister Crowley. And Aleister Crowley, uh, 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 I don't have all, I don't have, uh, it's in my notes here, established an order, order something, order or something in Great Britain, which was a, which was an occult organization based on the teachings of Blavatsky. Every one of them, they all have their own particular spin you know, they all have their own personal idea about how they can rise in it and how much they receive. But uh, he is directly connected with Blavatsky. 
And he is also connected. He has some disciples who came down to us today in what's called the uh, Scientology, the Church of Scientology. L. Ron Hubbard was the founder of this. And I'm going to read you some material about that in just a moment. And as you know, it's been in the news lately because a lot of the Hollywood stars, folks out in Hollywood, are, are members of the Church of Scientology. And uh, so we want to look at these things and see the connections there. If you'll remember this past Wednesday night, I told you that the Pope, Francis, has just uh, recently been pushing the idea that the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, written by Moses about 1,400 years before Christ, uh, some of the writings in, those, in, in his books are to, be, uh, are to be simply glossed over as uh, for whatever purpose God might have had in giving it. It's not the real truth. The real truth is that there was no Adam and Eve, that we're here by the process of evolution. Now, in the late 1800s, they call that theistic evolution. When Darwin came out with his theory of evolution, the church capitulated, many in the church capitulated, and began to accommodate evolution and God. And so what they did was to merge the two together and say, well, God created the world by evolution, so it became what's called a theistic evolution. They're still around. You just heard one. The Pope. The Roman Catholic Church has an observatory with a, with a very expensive uh, 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 telescope, and looking into the heavens, they have spent an enormous amount of money uh, investigating the, 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 uh, the heavens, the extraterrestrials. And they're making statements now about how that once they come in contact with these beings, that they're going to baptize them and bring them into the church. Uh, I give them credit for their audacity. Uh, the Catholic Church, therefore, by, 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 this, by, the, by this idea, is making it clear that they are part of the group who believes in transpermia. 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 The Greek word for seed is sperma. Spermatozoa is the speed of life. You, if you learn anything, you know, if you, you, you remember your biological lessons from, from health and, and so forth, uh, the idea is that the seed of life was transferred or transplanted here on this earth and we human beings showed up because of what happened from some ET or extraterrestrial. Uh, mostly the scientists that have abandoned evolution, and many of them have abandoned it, are now embracing the idea of transpermia. Now, what does that mean? That means that once I embrace this idea, I want to communicate with them. And that's exactly what's happening. Let me read something for you. I just read this the other day, first time I'd ever heard this. And uh, I read these articles, and then I'll read what people have to say, how they respond to it. And I thought this was quite a remarkable thing. And uh, I want to read it for you. I want you to hear what I read, and I want you to think long and hard on what I'm going to read to you. Now, this is from a person responding to an article about uh, Aleister Crowley. Was he a Satanist? That's the question posed. And uh, the, the article, of course, covers that. But then these people have an opportunity to respond. And here's what one person said. It was envisioned by him, but was later accomplished by Alan Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard. Remember, he's the Church of Scientology. They went into the Nevada desert and did rituals, now listen carefully, to open a long, sealed, magical doorway. Now, I haven't said much about that in here, but the occultists firmly believe that doorways can be opened into the spirit world. Now, listen to this. They opened a long, sealed, magical doorway. Bring about the moon child, etc. The moon child. Supposedly, it worked, and something inexplicable entered. Take note. Listen carefully. Since then, we've had a UFO explosion. We've had UFO ex uh, sightings since biblical times, yes, but 99% happened after that working. 
and a subject which I can elaborate on if you wish me to. UFOs have to be extra dimensional or time travelers, not ETs in the classic B movie image. So, what did this individual just say? They said that the occult world opened up the occult flood gates. And what people have been seeing now for since, uh, you know, how many of you know what happened in, uh, uh, in uh, New Mexico? Uh, what's Roswell, yes. Roswell, New Mexico. I mean, it's world famous. Uh, they supposed to had a uh, had a uh, had an E.T., a body of an E.T. and what have you. And the government came in right behind and covered it all up and said it was a balloon and what have you. But the bottom line is that it does appear that all of a sudden, the floodgates of UFOs were opened right at a certain period of time. And what we're seeing today is a product, according to this person, of the occult world opening a doorway. And of course, what happens when you open this doorway? What are we talking about? We're talking about demons. I've said it a thousand times and say it again. I do not believe that there is anything up there except from the third heaven where God dwells. The rest of that is just a bunch of mumbo jumbo. There are no little green men coming down from above, but there are little green men. All kinds of stuff's going on. Somebody said, well, how could something like that happen? What did Pharaoh's magicians do? They produced the same thing. They either gloss that over and say that didn't happen or that uh, Pharaoh was under an illusion and so Moses and so Aaron or something really happened. And then, of course, uh, Aaron, uh, Aaron's rod uh, ate up the, the, the other serpents. But the bottom line is that this world, this spirit world, can materialize in a lot of different ways. And uh, that may explain Bigfoot. It may explain a lot of things. Uh, the fact that they can materialize, but then there's nothing left later. I mean, has anybody ever produced a UFO craft? Do you know of any a museum you can go to where you can, you can find a crashed UFOs? You know, but you cannot discount the literally tens of thousands of reliable witnesses who have seen them. In World War II, when our fighters flying those P-52 Mustangs or what are P 52 or 51? P 51 Mustangs. When they, were when they were flying those fighters in World War II over Germany, <coughs> they started reporting back to their commanders that they were seeing fighters in the sky, planes in the sky, that they could not identify. They called them Foo Fighters. And they saw so many of them, our, our pilots saw so many of them that it, it, became a, it became a byword among, the, among, our, among our commanders and fighters in World War II about the Foo Fighters. So many of them saw them. Are all these men, are they all hallucinating? Is this just all a joke or, or were they really there? What about the, what about the professional pilots at 35,000 feet, flight level 35,000? They're up there flying along, and then they see this thing, and then the co and then the navigator sees it, and the co-pilot sees it, and the pilot sees it, and they see this thing, and it moves, and it's flying along, and then all of a sudden, it defies all the laws that we know of physics, and does a, and does a right angle turn and takes off at five thousand miles an hour. How do you explain that? It's real, folks, but it's not real like people think it's real. It's part of the great deception that's coming. It's part of the great deception that's coming to the world, but it's part of the spirit world. It's demonic. In my opinion, it is fully, completely, and totally demonic. So, coming back to Aleister Crowley, a door was open, these things begin to show up, and then all of a sudden, here we are today with all this effort going into the heavens, and we're preparing to communicate with somebody coming from the heavens, and all this stuff. What do you think all that's for? It's because a message is going to come down from the heavens. Yeah. And the message that comes down from the heavens is part of the great delusion, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Because we're going up into the heavens in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So who was Aleister Crowley? He said his number was 666. He said he was the beast, the Antichrist, Revelation 13. He absolutely hated Christianity and Christians. He despised them. He hated them. You know, I've often wondered, how could anybody hate the Lord Jesus Christ? 
How could you hate him? But some do. They hate him. They despise him. So the question is, was he a Satanist? All right, there's the play on words. Was he a Satanist? All right. Most of the occult world that I've studied so far doesn't, doesn't acknowledge the existence of Satan, period. Most of them will say Satan is simply an evil influence to counter the influence of Lucifer. You have Lucifer on one side, light bearer, Satan on the other side, the evil influence that balances them out. Yin yang, circle, in inside of it, the complete whole, light, dark, f male, female, and so forth. All right, you got all that. But Aleister Crowley was very sincere and very serious about what he believed. Here's what he said when he was lying on his deathbed. His last words as he lay dying on his deathbed were, quote, I am perplexed. Now, I have read where Anton LaVey, which is a disciple of this same group, it all, it continues on down. Anton LaVey, on his deathbed, last words out of his mouth, I have made a big mistake. Now you can type that in, Google it, and you'll find his defenders saying he never said it. And I wasn't there at his deathbed. You have to get the primary source to, to you know, to... Uh, to, to check it out to make sure it's certain, authenticate it. But I have no problem believing that Anton LaVey, when he got ready to leave this world, when he was leaving it and looking into eternity, said, I have made a great mistake. And this man, I am perplexed. What does the word perplexed mean? I'll tell you what it meant to him. It meant, I don't know that any of this stuff that I've ever taught or ever believed makes any sense to me whatsoever now that I am at this point. That's what it means. That's what it means. Perplexed. It's an enigma wrapped up in a riddle. I don't know what's coming. What's, what's all this about anyway? So certain in life that what they say is true until they face that moment of death. And you must be certain of this. It is appointed unto men once to die. It's not a game. When you come down to the last moments of your life, you're not playing with anybody. You're not trying to impress anybody. You are looking off into eternity. And I'll say this while I'm at it. You better be, you better be sure. You better be certain. When you come to that point and you're looking into eternity that you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you better be certain. Yeah, yeah. Or well, the term rock and roll, you know where that came from. I don't get into all that here this morning, but I mean that. Uh, like I said uh, last week, you've got the devil's music, and then you've got the music that was written to glorify God. Uh, let's read a, a couple of things here about him. Uh, about Anton LaVey. Would Crowley admit to being that kind of Satanist? Heavens no. But would he agree that he was a Satanist of any sort to answer that question? We shall turn to no lesser authority than Aleister Crowley himself. Page 51, the Confessions of Aleister Crowley. Crowley has this to say about Christianity and Satanism. It seems, quote, It seems I possessed a theology of my own, which was to all intents and purposes Christianity. My Satanism did not interfere with it at all. So what's going on here now? It's called, it's called redefining terms. They like to play with your mind. What is Christianity? Well, Christianity today, 2014, is a broad, sweeping statement about people who profess to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So therefore, you can break it down into biblical Christianity, then you can break it down into liberalism and all the rest of the so-called branches of Christianity. You've got people who deny the Bible and deny the deity of Christ, deny the virgin birth, deny all of these things, and yet they call themselves Christians. 
How in the world you can call yourself a Christian and deny the virgin birth and the blood atonement of Christ is beyond me. Pardon? That's an oxymoron. It certainly is. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, but they like to play with your mind. They love playing with your mind. Why? Because they're willing to say anything they want to say, redefine the terms when they're saying it, but you judge a tree by the fruit it bears. And what you have to do is look at the life of Aleister Crowley. Look at some of the things that he did. And I can't mention them in the church of God. I'm not going to do it in here. I'm not going to do it publicly before people. But nothing that ever went through your mind of the lowest filth that a human being could be involved in, uh, this, this man, he did it. Did it all. Did it all. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and in the final analysis, he wound up going off into eternity. But the point is about this man is that he is said by so many to be the most wicked man that ever lived. Now, this is only because they know him. This is only because he had a public, uh, he had a public persona. He, he, had a, he had an identity. Folks, listen, there is wickedness out there that is beyond belief. And the Bible says in the book of Revelation that you haven't known the depths of Satan. And I don't want to know the depths of Satan. I, I constantly pray to the Lord God, Lord, show me the line. I don't want to cross it. Show me how far to go with this. I don't want to go any further. I don't want to stir up stuff that doesn't need to be stirred up. So just leave it, leave it, to, leave it to be said that when these people call themselves uh, Satanists, they're playing with your mind. They are Luciferians. And being a Luciferian means that he believes that Lucifer is the true light, the source of light. And the only way that you'll ever get to the truth of that light, and this is very important, is by a spirit guide. And Aleister Crowley had a spirit guide. They all have spirit guides. They've got a spirit guide that teaches them the truth about this light, Lucifer. And so that's why you have to be so careful with the spirits. You've got to try them. Because if you don't try the spirits, you get in trouble. Just because something's spiritual doesn't make it good. Not at all. Listen to what this young lady right here did. Her name is Christine Wyke. She's a 50-year-old Michigan woman. And she went into the National, Nat National Cathedral in, uh, in Washington, D.C. And in that cathedral, the Muslims were having a prayer meeting. They had been invited into a Christian cathedral. This lady took it upon herself to go up there and confront these people. And here's what she said when she stood up. Now, this, is, took, this took gall. This took courage. She walked in there, and she stood up and said, quote, Jesus Christ died on that cross, pointing to a cross. It is the reason we are to worship only Him. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. We have built enough of your mosque in this country. Why don't you worship in your mosque and leave our churches alone? You realize that while they were in there having their so-called prayer meeting, they were denying the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ in a church. Now, how in the world, a, uh, it's Episcopal church, uh, how in the world could an Episcopal priest or anyone associated with that church stand by and let them come into that house and deny the deity of Christ? Folks, when a Muslim says to you, I love Jesus, he's not talking about your Jesus. Amen. Or when he says, oh, we believe Jesus is a prophet, he's still not talking about your Jesus. Right. All right, but here's what's going on. This produces confusion. And it produces chaos. And the movers and the shakers of a one world government want confusion and they want chaos. They want to bring order out of chaos. First, they produce a chaotic state. Then by producing a chaotic state, they're able to implement their plan for peace. And that's exactly what the Bible said was going to happen. He shall come in peaceably. The Antichrist is going to come offering peace. Israel has been driven by this current administration, the state of Israel has been driven, and they've just said it in the last few days, to the point that they are ready to go in and destroy the nuclear capability of Iran. And they're not playing games. And, it had, they had, and the reason I say pushed is because they, have, they finally have accepted the fact 
that Barack Obama and the present administration is not their friend. And that Barack Obama and the present administration is, is, is willing to let Iran have nuclear weapons, which of course is going to create the worst mess you ever saw in your Look what Saudi Arabia is going to do, their enemy. And the other, these countries are going to start, uh, it, it'll, be a new, it'll be a nuclear arms race like you wouldn't believe. But the Shiite Muslim in Iran, as I said to you weeks ago, is different from a Sunni Muslim in Saudi Arabia. When uh, Ahmadinejad, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was the president of Iran, he constantly talked about the Mahdi, the Mahdi, the Mahdi, the Mahdi. 90% of the talk about the Mahdi comes from a Shiite Muslim. There is some from a Sunni, but most of it's from a Shiite Muslim. The Mahdi is the precursor of the coming of, uh, of, the, of the Messiah, their Messiah. He is the one who comes back to this earth and he brings Jesus with him. And when Jesus comes back to the earth, Jesus is going to tell all the Christians like us that we believe the wrong thing, that Jesus is a worshiper of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of Allah, and that we're wrong and that we need to turn our focus not on Jesus, but on Allah and Muhammad his prophet. That's what they're teaching people. But uh, there's, there's an element in this uh, Shiite Muslim Mahdi group that believes that they need to bring a conflagration to the earth. They need to bring some kind of a war on the earth in order to bring their Mahdi back. That by creating all of this chaos, it will bring him back. And so when Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was in there, he made it plain that he wanted to drive Israel into the Mediterranean Sea that he wanted to whack them from the face of the earth. He was very vocal and, vi and uh, 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 vi vicious with, with, his, with his verbal assaults against Israel. No question about it. The fellow that's in there now is a cleric. He's a Muslim, Muslim cleric, and he's a little, a little more contained in what he says, but the idea is still the same. Iran wants to destroy Israel. And uh, Benjamin Netanyahu has an IQ of 160, let that settle in for a minute now. 160. Okay, 160. And he is the, he's the current Prime Minister of Israel. And he knows exactly how to handle himself when he comes over here and he deals with the White House and he deals with, with the politicians in this country. He knows who his friends are and who they aren't. All right, he knows. Netanyahu knows. But he also represents a nation that has what's called the Samson Option. Now, if you don't know what the Samson option is, you need to know. There is no question in anybody's mind that Israel has enough nuclear capability to turn all of the Middle East into, into glass. Yeah. But they haven't used that, have they? No. Because I would trust them more than I do that bunch in the White House. I do. I do. For the welfare of the United States of America, I don't trust the White House. I don't. Now, I trust a lot of those generals and a lot of the politicians, but there's a certain element up there. I wouldn't trust them as far as I could throw them with the, with the safety of this nation. But anyway, uh, this, <clears throat> this, uh, this nuclear capability that Iran has, that, that Iran wants, Israel has. It has. But it would be an absolute last resort, not a first resort. But with Iran, if they had it, they would use technical, tactical nuclear weapons. They'd use it to destroy Israel, and, and Israel knows that. So they will, folks, they will. When it happens, I don't know, and they're not going to broadcast it. They're not going to get on, they're not going to do like uh, Obama said, we will never put boots on the ground over there, we, you know, broadcast to the enemy. What they're not going to do, they're not going to do it. What will happen is that you'll read it in the paper one morning where they have, where they have struck Iran, and they have uh, hit this, they've had many targets, they know their targets, they know where they are, they've got them laid out, they know what, they know what, uh, what they're doing. And uh, you'll, you'll read it in the paper the next day. Of course, when that happens, what's going, what happens? Immediately, you've got war. You'll have war between Iran and Israel. And what that means is that all these countries in that area, they're going to have to choose sides. Choose sides. And that, of course, may bring a full-blown World War III. 
And by bringing a full-blown World War III, you've got the chaos that the one-worlders are looking for. You've got exactly the, the scenario that they're waiting on. And when that happens, then you'll have your man of peace. The man of peace will have the stage set for him to step on the stage of time and bring peace to the earth. That's your Antichrist. How close are we? We're close, we're close enough now for Israel to push a button. And send those fighter jets. I don't know how long it would take uh, from Israel to Iran. What are we talking about? Three or four hundred miles? Five hundred miles? Six hundred miles? Anybody know how far it is from Israel to Iran? That's five hours? Okay. Uh, the United States has got, uh, when you're looking at time... Uh, I read it one time. I forget how fast the sun moves across the earth. Is it something like a thousand miles an hour? Uh, has anybody read that lately? How fast does the sun move across the earth? How fast does it take it to move from the eastern time zone to the central time zone? In other words, from one o'clock at the eastern to one o'clock at the central. In other words, if you're in a jet, if you are in a fast jet and you leave New York, you can beat the sun to California. See what I'm saying? You can beat the sun. And, but you've got to be moving. Uh, you can beat it, though. But you've got to be, you've got to be flying at over 1,000 miles an hour. So the reason I say that is the difference, the, 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 the difference between the, the, the separation, the space between Israel and Iran, I don't know how long it would take one of their jets to get from Israel to Iran and bomb them and then get back. I don't know how long it would take. But however long, whatever he, whenever they give the command, uh, probably within 30 minutes, 45 maybe to an hour at the most, uh, the, the deed's done, the job's finished. And that's how quick the war can start, World War III. Aren't you glad that you're saved? Amen. That's what I was thinking in my mind. I didn't think it was quite as far as you had in your mind there. It's, you, take, uh, you take Russia, for example. You go from one time, you go, Russia, uh, I forget what it was. I read it the other day. Seems like Russia has either eight or ten time zones. Now look how big that country And time zone's the same regardless. It's the speed of the sun, a time zone. And uh, the United States has got uh, how many time zones? Mm -hmm. See? So look how much, I think Russia's 12 or 13. I, you, you look it up when you get home. It's a huge country. In, uh, in size compared to the United States. Uh, military planners, commanders, take that into account when they think about Russia firing missiles into the United States. How long would it take that ICBM to travel from wherever it's launched until it hits New York City or it hits uh, Chicago or Philadelphia or Detroit or Miami? Uh, how far? How long? Uh, do you remember when Brother... Uh, 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 Milton, uh, Milton uh, uh, Taylor talked about a 50 megaton bomb being exploded in uh, uh, somewhere in the south down there around Charleston, South Carolina. He was talking about how quickly that the shock wave from that would reach Chicago, Illinois. And then he gave you an idea of the total devastation, the area surrounding, which is at the beginning is complete devastation. And then the devastation decreases as the distance increases, but you still have devastation. And that the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki are firecrackers compared to what's out there now. Yeah. You don't want a nuclear war to break loose. No. That's the bottom line. And as I've said before, your best place to be if a nuclear war breaks loose is ground zero. Yeah. Yeah. It is. <laughs> You're gone. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about surviving. You're finished. You're you're vaporized. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Pardon? Samson option. You know the story of Samson. Samson. He pulled the he pulled the temple down on himself, committed suicide, and killed the enemies of God. That's what they have. Samson option, and the Arabs know it. They know it. They know it. And uh, this can happen, folks. This thing with Iran can happen. Now, why, would, why does it happen? Don't you think it would have been far better for the United States to maintain some kind of a policy toward Iran 
instead of appeasement, like a Chamberlain when he had tried to appease Hitler, instead of an appeasing po a policy, to simply say to them, you will never have a nuclear weapon in this country. Whatever we got to do to stop it, we're going to stop it. It's not going to happen. But look how Obama has backtracked in the last few months. But what does it do? What's it produced? He's creating a war. He's creating a world war. Absolutely. He's helping. He's, he's, a, he's a pawn to produce exactly what's necessary. So what I look for, folks, is chaos. I look for chaos. And from chaos, uh, Phoenix, the rise, the rebirth of, a, of, a, of life comes up from the ashes of it. And that's coming. It's coming. We're right, we're right at the door. All right, now next week we're going to pick up on Satan. I've, I've said a lot about Lucifer. And I'll, next week we'll pick up Satan. And we'll see what the Bible says about Satan. And that's very important to take what the book says and not what, to, not what people, what the occult world has to say or a witch has to say. I, read, I was reading a witch the other day, and she said, uh, Satan does not exist. And this was a classic example of a witch. And, of course, she doesn't call herself a witch. She's a Wiccan. Wicca. And, but, of course, she's a witch, according to the Scripture. All right, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll let you go. And we'll pick it up again next week. Brother Ronnie Crane, will you dismiss us, please?